Welcome to Mario Analysis for Hedgehogs. The last technical video has been quite a while ago, the reason being that we did this podcast in between. But I think for change, and uh, we should do another technical video, although we are still not done with the podcast, um, there's still one more um, episode to go. So, But let's start with um, another technical video. This time about Spora, the shortcut worm that is also ransomware. Um, or more specifically, I want to talk to you about how you can use malware analysts articles to help you learn about malware analysis. Now, these articles are not made for people who want to learn analysis. They are made rather for other analysts so they can um, benefit from the research results. So they don't show you how you get to these results, but they show you what um, the analyst found out about a certain ransomware or malware family. Now, how can you use that to learn? First off, you should get the exact same sample that's referenced in such an article. Um, usually these articles will present you the hashes of the samples that they used as a basis. And every proper article would do that because otherwise your claims cannot be verified or the claims of the author here um, in this article cannot be verified. So proper um, blog articles will provide the file hashes. Um, in our case, the starting point is an HTA application. HTA is an HTML application, so it's an HTML file with some executable code in it written in VB script or in J script or something similar. And um, that's the original file that drops then um, another dropper which drops Spora sample in the Word document. So we will be starting from that. You might already have problems here, like you might ask yourself, how do I get the exact same sample? Well, I will provide some links in the description below so you can um, links to, to sharing sites, links to forums where you can request samples, links to, um, for example, virusshare.com. Those are di databases where you can search for, for samples uh, via the hash and um, but for new samples, these databases, databases might not be um, up to date. Um, so you can always try to ask people who have access to virus tool or um, ask the analyst who wrote the article. I think a lot of them are happy to help you out if you say you want to learn analysis. Um, they will probably help you. Okay, so let's start with that. And um, the, um, the advantage of using these articles is if you are fairly new to malware analysis and you have an unknown sample, you really have uh, the problem that you don't know what there is in front of you. Like you will see something, you don't know what it is, you don't know how to interpret it. And that's uh, something, if you read the article, you already know the direction it's going to. And if you... Um, read the article and know what, what's happening in detail there. You can also just try to verify what's written there and um, see if you find out the same things and uh, if you interpret the things the correct way that you found out. So it's really an advantage if you already know what you are looking at. Uh, but you, you have yourself you have to work yourself to find out how you get to these results. Um, sometimes the articles will provide addresses, you can use them, so this is an aid already. Uh, sometimes they don't provide addresses, but you can see certain addresses in the, in the screenshots. Like in this case you see, yeah, I'm not connected to the internet, in this case you can see um, an address right here in the jump um, call. So you can use these addresses to find the, the reference functions. Um, or here, similar, there is um, 
if the if the person using IDA did not rename parts of the file like sub functions or um, sub procedures, they will also have the address in this label on this name, which you can use. <clears throat> All right. Now, what we want to do today is look at one part of the encryption procedure of Spora. The whole encryption procedure is fairly complicated. We cannot do all of that in uh, today, but let's just take a look at one part of it, namely the .key file and how this .key file is being encrypted using AES. Like it's written in here, the .key file contains some information, statistical information about how many files have been encrypted on the system um, and some, some other information, the locale, the username, the campaign ID um, and an RSA key. And this file is being encrypted using a newly generated AES key. And this key is then appended also in encrypted form to the key file after that. So. Let's just find this AES key, see if it's indeed AES 256 bit and see um, if that's being used to encrypt the key file content. So just that and let's go from there. Now our starting point is this HTA application. The HTA application drops another file, a JScript file into the temp folder and the JScript file drops a P file that's the Spora sample that we want to have. So this is our goal. And it will drop a corrupt word document. So let's just get this file here. That's what we want to have to get to the encryption function finally. So here's our dropper sample, our HTA. And uh, we will be using process monitor and process explorer before we can Wrap the samples. Yes. Let's try to kill the sample because before it's done with encryption. Um, for process monitor, you need to set certain filters. Um, first, uh, the filter for the process name should one should be mshta.exe because that file is being used to execute HTA files. Secondly, um, the JS the closed .js file is executed with wscript.exe. So you send this as a process name. In this case, I said it should contain script. So wscript.exe will be shown. And thirdly, the category should be right. So we see the right um, actions, the right operations by these files and can see where the drop files are being written to. So that's all we do. And we use Process Explorer to watch the processes appear and uh, kill the file when we don't need it anymore. Uh, kill the process, I mean. All right, execute that. And as expected, the Word file opens. We kill this. And we kill this also. Right. And now we see, okay, that's exactly what's described in the article. Close JS is dropped to temp. The P file is dropped to temp with the exact same name and the word document. Now this is um, not a random name. Uh, the article describes it as well that this is hard coded in the dropper in the JS file. If you deobfuscate that, you can see that too. And you can also see on virus total that uploads to in the additional information tab that uploads of Spora of the Spora samples use that name alongside other names like uh, this is dropped by the JS close JS whereas names like these are being uh, copies of this one like this uh, file will copy itself into a certain location and then um, use names with this pattern. And there's always different depending on the machine. So, and then there you have files like uh, always uh, files like these where the name is just the hash. Those were being uploaded by malware analysts usually. 
uh, as they like to use the hashes for the sample names. Okay, so we have the sample right here. So let's just go there and uh, drag and drop it to the desktop. And before we can disassemble that, we need to unpack the file because that's a UPX packed file. Yes, that's been UPX. Good thing about UPX is that unpacking is pretty easy and we will just do that. If you um, execute upx.exe, we'll show you which switches you can use. The minus D is for decompressing. It will decompress the file in place unless you give a minus O option to write, um, to give it a different location for that. So um, let's do that because we might want to keep the original file uh, decompressed and the original one was this. Now it unpacked this successfully and we can analyze that using IDER. I, again, I will use the free version of IDER, which is pretty old, it's 5.0, but this is um, because you can use that too without paying any anything. And the commercial version is pretty, pretty expensive. So not, it's not for everyone. Um, the uh, IDA is now analyzing the file, which takes a while. And then when this graph appears, we are done. And I recommend that you try to find yourself through this code and just take the article as a help if you don't get anywhere further. Like in this case, if you scroll down a bit, you see already here some, some functions related to encryption and the cryptic wire context. And um, so after that uh, cryptic wire context, or I, I would suspect there's more encryption going on. So I would probably analyze uh, these sub calls here and see what they do or sub processes. <clears throat> All right. And um, what is this doing? The cryptic wire context. It's uh, used to acquire a handle to a particular key container within a particular cryptographic service provider. So it is used in calls to the crypto API. And um, that's kind of the beginning for for some encryption stuff right here. And here's a key, a crypt destroy key. So basically I would search in between those two calls for more uh, for more stuff that's happening with the encryption in Spora. But if you don't get anywhere with this, just as I said, use the screenshots as a hint where these functions you are searching for might be. Today, I would like to verify just one small thing. The encryption procedure of Spora is quite complicated. So let's just verify a small thing about that. And that's this one. There's a key file in Spora, and the, the in Spora, Spora writes a key file. This key file saves information about um, some statistical information, how many files of which category have been encrypted by Spora, and what's the username and what's the um, locale of the system. And also it saves an RSA key in, in the key file. And these contents are encrypted with AES 256 bit. So let's just verify the small fact that this AES key is 256 bit is being used to encrypt the key file, not more. And if you don't get along finding that, just use this uh, hint here, 4041D7 or 4041E0. Um, in the screenshot, the jump location that will bring you into the right uh, area where you can find the code that you're looking for. So we will jump to this address uh, 4041E0 and that should be about the, the right area of the code you're looking for. That looks correct, something with the key file is being done here and um, we go back to the beginning 
we will rename this function so we know that it's doing something to the key for do or, or let's say key for function some key for function we don't know yet what it does but we can rename it when we know more so rename it, it again and right in the beginning of that function we see a group can key call what is that doing again visit the documentation Crypt can key generates a random cryptographic session key or public private key pair, so probably depending on the algorithm. A handle to the key is returned, and this handle can be used as needed with any crypto API functions that require the key handle. <clears throat> the calling application must specify the algorithm when calling this function because this type is kept bundled with the key. So that's important. Like the key um, determines the algorithm, um, and it's well, the information what algorithms used is bundled with the key. So this uh, function, cryptgenKey, already determines which algorithm is being used. And that's in this uh, parameter of the function, the ALG ID, or algorithm ID, that identifies the algorithm. Clicking on that, you get to um, this page that describes the algorithm ID and the values here. So use that value to see what algorithm is being used with that key. And taking a look here, the algorithm ID is 6610 in hex. Compare that and you find out that this is indeed AES 256. Yeah, so we are on the right track. We know that this is being used and um, the key that is being generated is written to that address that is pushed here onto the stack. And what is in EAX at this point, it's um, the address that is a um, that is the local vari variable called H key. Um, Ida named it H key because it's being used as H key. But we already know more about it. We know it's an AES key. So let's just write it in here and rename that. And then we know when it's being used again that this is an AES key 256 bit. And indeed, it's being used later on with the script export key function. Um, so it kind of converts this key to something else, to that buffer here. Um, converted AES key. <clears throat> All right, and um, if you look down a bit, there is a call to crypt encrypt, which is used to encrypt some data. And um, crypt encrypt it encrypts data the algorithm used is designated by the key held by the csp module and is referenced by the h key parameter so the h key parameter here will determine the algorithm that's being used by crypt encrypt um, whereas pb data that says it's a pointer to the buffer that contains the plain text to be encrypted so if you debug it you can see in this um, uh, what kind of data is being encrypted, but we already know that it's the AES key that's being encrypted right here. Um, yes, the key is being encrypted using another key and that's being pushed onto the stack here. If you follow that, it's um, in the text section, it's a value in the text section. And this address is being referenced by another function. Like it's referenced by our function, of course, but also by another one. And if you click on that, you get here into this function. You would have to analyze this function to know where this key is coming from. But just look at the calls right here. Uh, some object is being decoded. And later on, there's some crypt import public key info. So a key is, public key is imported. So it looks like the key we, will be, we were looking for, um, this H key, is a an RSA key, public RSA key. So let's rename that to public RSA key. Okay. 
and we'll go back to the key file function where it's being used. So a public RZ key is being used to encrypt this um, exported RES AES key. Good, but this is not what we wanted to see, but you can you will know from the text here that this is indeed the case. This newly generated AES key is being encrypted with the attacker's public RSA key, right? Okay, but is this AES key now also used to encrypt the key file content? Probably, let's take a look. Um, here's another call to crypt encrypt. And this time, H key is the AES key, the original one, not the encrypted one. And PB data is in this uh, buffer. So here's the plain text that's being encrypted. And what you would have to do is look for, for where this comes from. So this is a parameter to the key file function. That means if you um, debug this file and just um, look into the contents of this buffer, you might see what, what's inside. You might see that this is indeed the key file content, which is probably created before this key file function is called. So yeah, if you look down below, you will see some calls to create file and write file and this uh, pattern with this dot key in the end. So this will be creating the actual key file and writing the encrypted contents to disk. And um, that's the right function here. We were looking at using AES 256-bit uh, encrypting this uh, key file content. So let's rename it maybe key file content. You would have to verify this, that this is indeed the content. But I think, I think you get the hang of it now, yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, that's the cool thing about renaming it. Yeah, if it's la used later, you can see what is being done. Like we have this this name here, yeah, of the key file, and then there's a write for operation with this content. Um, makes sense, I think. Okay, and that's it for today. I don't want to make this any longer. I think it's. I'm also a bit exhausted by now. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I hope to see you next time. I think the next video will be the podcast again. So stay tuned and thank you for watching. Uh, we will be continuing and uh, please see that as well. So see you next time.